Our, our last speaker needs very little introduction, Brian Jacob, who is a fixture here at SAGES and also started the International Hernia Collaboration, but he's going to talk about something quite interesting that uh, not everything can be fixed in the operating room, and, and these are complicated patients. Uh, for Just as a note, the ventral hernia session continues on right into hereafter, and so uh, we'll try to save questions for just out in the hallway afterwards. If, um, if people have questions, yeah. just try to catch any of us. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dana and David, uh, in the audience, for uh, this really unique chance to give a talk. Uh, and also, thank you to the speakers. Um, that was really a very thorough coverage of, of England hernias and their complications. Um, welcome to the club. And so, as you continue down your path of treating chronic pain after England hernia pairs, you're going to get to what I'm about to teach you. So, stay tuned for the end, because that's where it all comes in. Um, but a lot of these patients that are out there are, are truly suffering, and, and these are my disclosures, uh, none of which will affect this. Uh, and that says, there is no Wi-Fi in the forest, but I promise you will find a better connection. Um, and this talk is about connections. So I want to try an experiment with you all. If you just take a second, take a deep breath, and stare at this video, and tell me what the first thing that comes to your mind is. It could be anything. You could judge the speed that I'm playing it back. You could judge the fact that there's a plug in there that needs to come out. What did you connect to immediately? What's the very first thing? And then ask yourself, how many of you thought about the actual patient that's going through this? And what kind of delay and workup they needed to get to that when all they went in was for a hernia repair at some point in their life? How many of you actually thought about the patient as opposed to the technique? So you just heard that the differential pain is huge, right? There's meshes and sutures and tacks, and there's trapped nerves or anterior cutaneous nerve entrapment syndrome, hidden little hernias that you can't see on imaging, lipomas, endometriomas, or just pain of the round ligament. Of course, there's the whole sports world of osteitis, aponeurotic plate injuries, adductor injuries, um, and all the other things that can happen to your back and hip that can cause pain in the groin. We've seen all that. But what I want to focus on in this talk is the psychosomatic stuff and the other previously unprocessed trauma, whether it's conscious or unconscious, in your patients that are contributing to this and also possibly preventing a, pu a cure despite great intent by the surgeons to treat and take out mesh or take out nerves uh, or fix recurrent hernias. Uh, and so it's this uh, section that I want to spend the next few minutes on. And if I cut into the 11 o'clock time, I'm sorry. But so, you know, hidden hernias I saw, you know, we heard about, they're, they're definitely possible. I'm pointing to the left internal ring there. And you can see this patient's got a hernia in a very atypical location. The direct space is in the distance. Um, but you need to make thorough examinations for hernias so that you can actually find them. And of course, if you go in to take out a nerve, make sure that you send pathology so that you can confirm it actually was a nerve. Um, this here looks like a nerve, and actually it's just a little fiber of, of, of tissue that we thought was a nerve. Uh, so you have to be very careful when you're doing these things to make sure you actually take out uh, what you intend to. And of course, we've all seen the, the, the mesh that, that goes wrong, even with a, a great implant, uh, or even clips that rotate and, and poke upward, and, and we've all had our fair share of, of plugs that come out and, and, and eroded things. But surgery may not be the cure. It actually may only be a piece of these patients' journey towards full healing. And that's really, really important and something that I've gotten into over the last three years as I've gotten very deeper and deeper into this pathway of trying to take on chronic pain in my, my, my patients. Uh, you've heard people drop percentages of patients that get better. What percent actually do get better after all these great techniques are done? The truth is it's only about 70 to 80 percent. And I think that's very important to disclose to your patients because that means 30% are not completely resolving. Maybe partially, but a lot of them don't. Why? Number one, you either missed the actual cause, so even though we had really great intent, took out the nerve, fixed the recurrence, took out the mesh, uh, we just missed it. We just didn't get it right. Uh, that's possible. The second is their mental health. And the mental health is something that has drove me crazy that we're not diving into deep enough with our patients and we're not emphasizing it in our histories enough. Uh, you have to remember that what they just went through is going to create some sort of subclinical post-traumatic stress in that patient. Why? You've, they've been told by their first surgeon to wait for three months before getting surgery or in repair, which I think is completely wrong. And the second thing is that they may have gone years of several different doctors who think they're crazy. So what is that called in real life? It's called gaslighting. The other thing is they may have come to the table with pre-existing trauma from their past, from their childhood, that's actually being harbored or residing or embodied in them in some place, which I'll get into in a second. 
These things are real, they are important. And I know as surgeons, we don't think like this, but when you start to connect to your patients, they do. And I think it's gonna be really important for you in that state. So what, where does this all fit in, right? Chronic post-op pain, we've seen it. Patient gets hernia, they get the gross chronic post-op pain. But if you divide those patients into two groups, the ones that are completely stable with no mental health history, they can handle these type of hits, they can process it. But there's a group of people who cannot. And if we don't understand them, before we operate on them, you're gonna miss this. And the only way to really get a hint at it is they'll have in their medicine section that they're on Lexapro, or they're on Zoloft. And it may look like nothing, and they may just say anxiety. But if you actually ask them, is it working? When did it start? What's this all about? They'll tell you, because now they're con you're connecting to their vulnerability. And they want to. They, don't, they want to come out with this stuff and tell you. They don't want to hide it, just like it's, we don't hide high blood pressure, other, C other comorbidities like COPD. They want to come out and tell you about their mental health. In any event, they get the chronic post-op pain treatment uh, or diagnosis, and the what happens to them, they either get dismissed by their first surgeon, misled, sent elsewhere, or they do receive corrective surgery. And like I said before, if you're lucky, you get a cured patient. But more, more common than not is you get the cured patient, but now they've got some sort of traumatic event from the last months or years of what's been happening to them, because they have no idea what a plug is. They don't know what a recurrence is. And then worse, those patients who came to you with a previous problem that's with pain stored in the region that you've operated on, whether it's epigastric, umbilical, or groin, now it's re-triggered, now things are gonna really spiral. Now you're gonna be chasing your tail, trying to fix them with surgery, and you can't. So where does pain actually, and stress, get stored in the human body, right? Now we have to go to our Eastern West medicine practices to understand this concept. If you have ever been upset, angry, depressed, Whatever it is, you'll feel it someplace in your body if you concentrate. And that could be in your throat, your heart area, the solar plexus, the sacral plexus, and or the root. And what's interesting to me, and I know that this is, is a little bit out there, is it sort of correlates a lot to where these hernias can, can occur. Okay, so if I can go back to that for a second. I don't say this because there's a correlation, but I say this to be very careful when you're blaming mesh for somebody's pain because pain does sit in these regions, and if, you, if there's mesh there, it's gonna be very easy to think it's the mesh. And it may be, but not always. And that's what's gonna be really important. I'm gonna show you a few cases of that. The truth is we hide our stress and our anxiety and our pain in the nervous system, in our memory, without us being aware of it. And it can be in the parasympathetics or the sympathetic, so it can sit out anywhere. I tell some of my patients, if you've been diagnosed with something that ends in an S or syndrome, more likely than not, you're hiding some sort of pain in a nervous system that's affecting that organ. Um, and when they go back and look at it. So if you could turn the volume up. But anyhow, this patient actually Before describes this bloating and pain that happens even when he thinks about it. Um, and he had been told by previous people that he's got a diastasis, he should have his diastasis repair. Uh, he's got this tiny thing in the umbilicus that you can't feel, but he came to me and I said, don't do anything. We need to figure out what that's from because there's literally nothing there. And it turns out that this patient was actually assaulted on the job beat up with several uh, severe punches and a baseball bat to the gut um, about 10 years ago. And my guess is if we can go dive in there a little bit deeper, this anxiety and pain he's having in his solar plexus is probably related to that and has nothing to do with his hernia. But that type of history would be um, tough to get if you don't know to ask the right questions. Uh, this is a, a clip it's from the Dear Evan Hansen movie, and it's just showing a way to bond with your patient, and they're casually saying they're two different people from two different backgrounds, they have nothing in common, and then the woman says to him, well, what are you on? And he goes, oh, I take Lexapro and Zoloft. And she says, well, well I take Ativan as needed um, and Wellbutrin. And they... <laughs> well, you're like the president of a million different groups at school, and you're like part of every single activity, and you're, you know, and I'm, um, I am not. What do you take? I'll go first. I'm on Lexapro, 10 milligrams. Well, well I, I'm on Zoloft uh, and Wellbutrin and um, out of van as needed. Depression, anxiety. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Some days it's just like, uh, it's like, um, impossible. Yeah. yeah. And they connect through their vulnerabilities, through their mental health diagnoses, and this is true in all relationships. 
this is the video I saw, I showed you in the beginning with sound and how you treat chronic pain. Um, but it is not how you treat PTSD because that's ultimately what we're dealing with on a spectrum. So when people come in with these chief complaints that they can't see straight or they're having weird fevers or they're, uh, as you see in these different diagnoses, they're excessively thinking about it. It's called ruminating. They're excessively talking about it. They can't concentrate. They've lost interest. They sleep all the time. They lose energy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not something you blame on the mesh. This is PTSD in a very subtle form. And if you miss it and you start blaming on other things, you risk actually gaslighting them further. So you must make sure that their PTSD is being looked at as they go forward. How do you do that? As we fast forward to the end of what I want to get to. Right. So there's lots of things out there that may sound like voodoo, things that we don't take seriously, like mindfulness, traditional psychologists or pain medicine rehab people. But there are other things out there that can really help people start getting to the root of the pain. And with regards to mindfulness, I'll, we'll give my hospital a plug because they've done this thing called a pause, even for us as surgeons, with all the stuff we're taking on. Uh, they send out a, a weekly text that you click on, and when you um, click on it, it takes you to uh, an actual 10-minute meditation. So every Wednesday, the Department of Surgery sends out this pause. You can stop what you're doing and listen to it. And if you actually do it, uh, it's, it's a really great way to embrace mindfulness. There's acupuncture, there's zero balancing, there's yoga, and there's Pilates, and I'm going to skip the, the details on these because my time ran out. Uh, there's Kundalini, there's Reiki, there's float tank therapy, and there's sound baths. Uh, there's lots of things that people can do to relax themselves, get in touch with their anxiety, and realize that the pain that they're experiencing is not actually part of their physical body, but is actually something they've memorized. And that you can break that loop. But breaking the loop is not easy, and this is where psychedelics come in. And when I mention the word psychedelics, I want all of you to see what your body's reaction was. Did you kind of freeze up a little bit? <laughs> Are you really uncomfortable to talk about them because it reminds you of the 60s and the 70s and tripping? Or have you started reading about, right, reading about the new medicine-assisted psychotherapies that are coming out? Uh, specifically for PTSD, uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, or MAPS, uh, has, was established in 1986 and has helped the FDA approve um, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Uh, and a lot of different institutions are coming up with this. If you had the video with sound, it's wild because you can see her actually getting MDA and listen to get her getting MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for PTSD. Uh, but it's appropriate because here we are in Denver. Denver was actually the first to decriminalize psychedelic mushrooms for the purpose of research and treating mental health two years ago, long before everybody else did. And now they're even easing the laws to the point where they're making it um, a very, very low priority so that the people who are starting these studies, even though it's still an illegal medicine, can actually proceed with them through MAPS. You may say, is there literature? Well, there is. There's actually randomized prospective double-blind studies that are coming out this year showing the ability for MDA-assisted psychotherapy to help treat people break those cycles of ruminating about their pain that's going on, that they experienced from the gaslighting, that they experienced from the experience, and they can, from, of, even if it's from surgery, and started to break that cycle. There's even literature coming out looking at chronic pain and psychedelics, this is a psychotherapy, quite a bit of it out there. And this is just one example of a study that came out recently showing that when administered, people's preoperative treatment pain scores dropped precipitously during the treatment and then stayed dropped compared to their baseline postoperatively, spawning the interest for more studies supported by the government. Right now, there's only above ground ketamine clinics to help with this. There's a lot of patients that you have have serious chronic pain who are going to seek underground treatment. This is what that would look like. Uh, these are done through practitioners or facilitators or shamans who can offer treatment to help people get away from their chronic pain. But also in big business, uh, there's a lot of companies looking at serotonin agonists to attack the serotonin 2CA receptors. This is just one company in Colombia. This is my hope for the future where we can work with our Eastern practitioners at the same conference, this was us in AHS, where a shaman came and gave a talk about how he's healing chronic groin pain patients after mesh with some of this. And I think it's something that we're gonna see in the future. Um, just understand that your patient's pain is real. It's real to them. It may not be from something you can cure with your hands. You may need to outsource them, not just to chronic pain and rehab people, but to alternative places where they can start to realize that the pain loop needs to stop because the source is gone or that the source even predates them meeting you or getting a hernia repair. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you so much. And if I could just ask all our speakers maybe to stay a minute outside, so if people have questions they want to ask, we can, we can ask them out there. And apologies for running a few minutes over. Thank you, everybody.